Hello everyone, how are you doing? Welcome along to Glasgow Science Centre's Curious About the Human Body Digital Festival. My name is Patrick, I work at the Science Centre and today you are joining us for the lung dissection which will be carried out by our very own Harriet. Today in our lung dissection we're going to be taking a closer look at a pair of sheep's lungs. Dissections involve cutting the organ and taking a good close look and seeing what we can find. So during this dissection, if you feel a little bit squeamish at any point and you want to look away, feel free to do that for as long as you need to. If you have any questions, please also feel free to add them into the live chat comments box and we'll hopefully answer them after the dissection is over. Over to you, Harriet. Hi Patrick, thank you so much for having me today. And as Patrick mentioned, uh, we are going to be looking at a pair of sheep's lungs that I have right in front of me. And we're gonna use them as a way to explore the structure and function of lungs within our body. So before we begin the dissection, we need to know a little bit about how our lungs work. So where our lungs are on the body, they are inside our chest cavity. And if you were to pop your hands in your chest and taking a deep breath through your nose and mouth, you can be able to feel your lungs expanding with air. Now, there is a special gas in the air that we need in order for our human bodies and our other organs to function, and that is oxygen. So our lungs are a way of getting oxygen out from the air around us, into our bodies, and into our bloodstream so we can send it where it needs to go for our bodies to function. Now, our lungs aren't just taking in air and expelling air completely by themselves. Uh, they're part of a respir a, our respiratory system and they have a couple other of organs and muscles helping them out. So actually, if we take a little look on our lungs directly, I can show you one of the muscles that helps our lungs to function. So you might be able to see it's quite thin. We have a little section of it right here. This is called our diaphragm. Now, you might have heard the word diaphragm before. If you play a musical instrument or you need a lot of breath or if you sing, uh, we use our diaphragm to support our breath. And it's a very, very strong muscle. You can see I'm pulling at it as hard as I can and I can't tear into it at all. Our diaphragm is actually made of the same kind of muscle as our heart. And that's because it has to work about as hard as our heart does. It contracts and expands to pull air into our lungs and to push air out of our lungs just as often as we breathe. So that is all the time, even when you're sleeping throughout your entire life. Now, when oxygen enters into our body, of course, it doesn't go straight into the lungs. We are breathing usually through our nose and mouth. So we're gonna follow the journey of that air all the way through down to our lungs. And we're gonna look at it as we explore our lungs right here. So. Once you breathe in through your nose or your mouth, the air is then gonna travel down your windpipe. Our science word for that is trachea. You might even be able to feel it at the front of your throat. So I'm gonna cut into the trachea that we have on our lungs. You can see it's just the tube right here. Now, as I cut into the trachea, you can see we have this kind of white, you might be able to see a little bit right here, this white kind of flexible substance. It's quite stiff, but it's also bendy. So this is cartilage. It's a substance that isn't rigid like bone. It's nice and bendy. And that's because we need to keep our airways open. We need access to them all of the time. But we also need to be able to move our necks, bend our, our necks as well. So this way, we can keep our airways open We've got a nice flexible material so we're able to move around. So I'm gonna cut a little bit further into our trachea to see the next part of the lungs that our oxygen is going to go into. So if we go down just a little bit further, see if we can see it on camera. There we go, we'll try and get a good look at this. So you might be able to see we have two cavities right here, one on the left and one on the right. They look a little bit like nostrils to me. And these are our bronchi. I kind of like to imagine the lungs as a tree. So if we think of the trachea as our tree trunk, the bronchi are like the branches 
going off into our right and left lungs. So I am going to choose the left today. We're going to follow the left bronchi into our lung. So I'm going to cut a little bit further. As you might be able to see, our lungs aren't just big, empty balloons, big sacks of air. They look quite spongy and they have all of these other little holes and cavities all the way down. This is called our bronchial tree. So we've gone to the bronchi, we're going into the bronchioles. So from our tree trunk, our trachea, to our branches, our bronchi, we've gone in now to the twigs, our bronchioles. So as the air travels down through here further and further, it's going to get more and more to this kind of spongy substance that you can see. The last destination that our oxygen is going to is called the alveoli. Now the alveoli are really, really small. You won't be able to see them necessarily with the naked eye. But if you were to look at them under a telescope, for example, they would look kind of like a bunch of grapes, I think. Um, little um, like balloons almost, I like to think of them as. And they are absolutely covered in blood vessels. This is because this is where a really important process happens in our body. This is where the gas exchange happens. Because as we talked about at the beginning, oxygen doesn't just go to the lungs. We take an oxygen through our lungs so we can send it to all the different organs in our bodies to allow them to function properly. So at the alveoli is where the oxygen actually goes into our blood system. So it's gonna travel through the blood to all those other organs by diffusing, by just kind of oozing through the alveoli. Um, and when we are done with that, we are breathing out. We're breathing out all the stuff that we're not gonna use. We're breathing out all of the waste, and that is in the form of carbon dioxide. So that is a good look at our lungs. And I talked about it being spongy. I can actually show you just how spongy it is. I'm gonna cut off a section here because it has all of these little spongy parts, all of these little bits that are really, really good at holding air. We've got a lot of surface area in our lungs to hold air. If I was to put a little bit of lung in the water, you'd be able to see that it floats, it's buoyant. There we go, you can see it a little bit better on camera there. So that brings us to the end of our little bit of dissection, but Patrick, I think you have a couple of questions for me. Well done, Harriet. That was beautifully done. Nothing like a dissection on a Friday morning to get us all going. <laughs> um, do, do you enjoy doing that? What, how, how do you enjoy doing the dissections? Is it something that you takes a bit of getting used to or, or have you Definitely. been able to do it quite well? I, I've done a couple of dissections, mostly hearts and lungs. And the first time I was trained in doing dissections, we were all sitting in the lab together and we had a big box. So everyone had a set of lungs and a heart to practice on. And the smell was <laughs> overwhelming. <laughs> but you do you do get used to it the more the more that you get on. It's not for the faint of heart. Uh, there's definitely some people who are a bit more squeamish, but I like getting stuck into the blood and guts and everything. I do have to say I'm quite glad that I've got the sort of presenting job today <laughs> <laughs> rather than the, 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 the dissection part. And um, so I think we've had some some questions in during your dissection, Harriet. And the first one is, yes, yeah, so, so these are sheep's lungs that, that we were working with today. How similar or different are they to human lungs? So uh, the sheep's lungs actually have a really fascinating difference to human lungs. Um, as you might be able to see, if we look at our camera for a close up on our lungs, our lungs aren't just one big And we have these little lobes coming off of them. Now humans also have lobes on their lungs, but just not as many as a sheep does. You can see we have two right here. We've got one, two, three, four lobes on this lung right here. Sorry, my hand was in the way. There we go. All these lovely, lovely lobes. So this is one of the adaptions that sheeps have, sheeps, sheep have, <laughs> there we go, in order to live at high altitudes. They have more surface area on their lungs and they're able to get more oxygen in air that maybe doesn't hold as much oxygen in a high altitude. I had no idea about that. And I suppose it makes sense because whenever you watch 
even documentaries about you know people who climb mountains or people who live in Nepal, they've, their air capacity and their lung capacity is typically higher than, than ours because we live closer to the ground. And I think we have a, another question. Oh, this is from uh, Lochfield Primary School, Primary 4, who ask, what happens to the lungs if people smoke? Great question. Hi, Lockfield. Uh, so what happens to your lungs when you smoke is, well, one of the things that can happen is you can inflame your airways. So things like the trachea and the alveoli can be inflamed. And one of the body's responses to that is to produce more mucus. So you might find someone who smokes heavily uh, can frequently have a cough, uh, but it also puts you at risk for some other um, illnesses to do with your lungs. It can reduce your lung capacity. Uh, so it's not a good idea to smoke. It can be quite damaging. Absolutely. I think we've got more information as well about the, the lungs and the impact of, of things like smoking on the Curious About website. So if anybody wants to check that out or if teachers want to go into a bit more detail, feel free to head over to the Curious About website and have a look. I think we're ready for the next question. Well, I think you touched on this a little bit, Harry, but maybe we can go into a little bit more detail with this one. Uh, what other organs are involved in our respiratory system? So the organs that we involve in a respiratory system, we talked about the nose and mouth, that's where we take in air through. We have the trachea, also the pharynx, which is our science name for our throat. Uh, and below the pharynx, we also have the larynx. You might know that more commonly as the voice box. That's where air travels through our vocal folds, which vibrate, they kind of almost like this, they kind of flap together so we can make noise through uh, sending the air through that vibration. And of course, we have our lovely diaphragm uh, right here, as I showed on the camera earlier, this very, very strong, but very, very thin muscle that allows us to inhale and exhale. I think I've heard of pharynx and larynx when people talk about singing. It's because you sort of need to control that when you're, when you're singing and also breathing in through your diaphragm to get a nice big proper proper breath. And um, just to remind our audience, if they're watching, you can send in your very own questions live uh, via the, the comment section on the stream. So feel free to get in touch and ask Harriet anything you want to know about the lungs. I think we've got another question ready to go. <laughs> Great question. Um, why do we need two lungs? Do we need two lungs? That is, that's a really interesting <laughs> question. So you, you could actually live a fairly normal life all being well with one lung, uh, but our body wants to work at the highest capacity that we can. Uh, we have two lungs because oxygen is really, really important for a lot of processes in our body. It helps with the release of energy in our cells. Uh, so we want more surface area. We want the most amount of space that we can to get as much oxygen into our bodies as possible. Uh, but you, you would be able to survive uh, with one lung if needed need be. I had no idea but that. that's amazing. I suppose it makes sense to have two because it means like you say you're getting as much air into your body as you possibly can so you can take that nice deep breath. And I think we are ready for the next question. This one is from Kim Craigie. Hello Kim. Uh, how do you train to get a job like yours Harriet? <laughs> I did a lot of things before I started working at the Science Centre. Um, so I've been a science communicator for about six years now. Uh, three of those were spent at Glasgow Science Centre. But I'm going to pull back the curtain a little bit. I don't have a science degree. I actually started as a science storyteller uh, in children's theatre. I was working with the Edinburgh Science Festival uh, to basically do shows about fairy tales, but with a scientific twist. So we would do, for example, Goldilocks and the Three Bears and talk about how her process of deciding which bed was just right was actually quite scientific. <laughs> she tested out every single option uh, and then came up with a conclusion, you know, it was a nice repeatable experiment. Um, and then I started working at the Edinburgh Science Festival and eventually here. So I've done a lot of different things when it comes to science communication, but don't need to technically be a scientist in that kind of very academic sense. To get a job in STEM, we need all sorts of people working in STEM communication. And how do you think working as a storyteller helps you with your communication and, you know, doing things like a, a lung dissection? 
I think I think storytelling and science learning are really go hand in hand. Um, we love stories as a way of storing information. In fact, you might remember things like um, Roy G. Biv as a way to uh, remember the rainbow. I learned to, as Richard of York gave battle in vain. We like to make <laughs> up stories to help our short-term memory store information in our brains. Uh, so when it comes to learning, storytelling is something that's really, really powerful. Um, so I think being a storyteller and being involved in the story of science as well helps to put it in context, helps to keep it in our brains and helps us to relate science to our everyday lives because it does impact so much of our everyday lives. That's amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Kim, for sending in that question. I think we're ready for that the next one. Good question. <laughs> oh, Lockfield again. Hello, Lockfield. Um, so this is primary five, Miss Clark's class. Hello, Miss, uh, Miss Clark's class. That's a tongue twister, that. Um, they ask, how long have you been a scientist? Oh, we've sort of talked about this a little bit or working at the Science Centre, and what does your everyday scientist life slash job consist of? So what's a typical day? Because you're not dissecting oh, wow. lungs all day every day, are you, Harriet? No, I don't think <laughs> there is such a thing as a typical day. Um, so I've been a science community cater for quite a while, and my day could look anything from, you know, being on the floors, chatting with customers, looking at exhibits, presenting in the planetarium. We just got some flight simulators. I learned how to fly a plane on Wednesday, <laughs> last Wednesday, um, doing lung dissections. Uh, even, you know, I was uh, with the Institute of Physics recently and we were singing songs about science and telling stories. Uh, so there's not really a typical day as a science communicator. And uh, from my friends who aren't research scientists, they don't seem to have a typical day either. I have friends who run code in simulations to find out what happens to stars when they die. I have friends who work with ballet dancers to track their movements so we can understand how we feel emotion through watching someone's movements. And I have a friend who used to collect newts and put them in a bucket to count them so we knew how many newts were in an area. There's not really a typical day as a scientist. And what do you think your favourite thing about working at the Science Centre is, Harriet? Like what, what do you enjoy the most? I think the honest answer is I enjoy the people the most. I think it's really, really fun to be able to learn something new every day and then get to share it with everyone else and learn what they know. Because the thing is, you know, no matter what background you have as a science communicator, you're still learning something brand new every day and you get to share that with the people around you. Amazing. Thank you, Miss Clark's class. Uh, next time you're in the Science Centre, if Lockfield get coming to the Science Centre and you see myself or Harriet, please come and say hi and we will remember who you are. Uh, I think we're ready for the next question. Well, that's a great question because I suppose everyone watching this is only watching this. They can't come up and, and have a feel of the lungs and get to know the texture. So Harriet, maybe as best as you can. You sort of describe them as sponges, but what else do they feel like? Oh, OK. So... They feel spongy. The trachea and down into our bronchi and our bronchioles feel kind of ribbed. The cartilage feels a little bit hard. I can only describe it as like, you know, your fingernails after you've been in the bath for a really long time and they get a little bit soft. Um, and it they're cold because they've been in the fridge. <laughs> and they're really, they're really flexible as well they feel that you know you can you can see i can depress them quite a lot with my fingers it's something in between a sponge and bread dough <laughs> is the best i can explain it sponge and bread dough there you go um just a reminder to all the schools watching and everybody watching feel free to send in your very own questions to to myself and harriet we've got um, a little bit of time left and you can do that via the live chat comment function. Um, we've got another question in from Kay McLachlan. Hello Kay McLachlan. Uh, how big do your lungs expand as you breathe in? And that's, oh it's from Langcraig's primary six and seven. Hello Langcraig's. So how big yeah. do your lungs expand as you breathe in? They, they expand quite large. Obviously, they still fit in our bodies uh, when we're taking a really deep breath in. And we actually have an exhibit here at the Science Centre where we have a set of lungs that we've preserved in formaldehyde and you can inflate them yourself. Um, they don't expand a huge, huge, huge amount. Um, if I had a pump, I would be able to show you here. But, you know, your lungs have about 1,500 miles of airway uh, inside all of these little spongy bits in the bronchi and the bronchioles. Did you say 1,500 miles? 
of yes. Amy. So if, what's if that? I... That's, that's, that's a really long way. It's a really, <laughs> really long way. I, off the top of my head, I can't even think of how far that would be. Um, definitely not all the way across the Atlantic, um, but pretty, pretty far. Um, but if I was able to like kind of squash and stretch out these lungs as far as they could possibly go, if I was to flatten them like a pancake, uh, essentially they would fit just about the size of a tennis court. Uh, so obviously, our bodies are not tennis court shaped or sized. Uh, so Imagine they were. That way. <laughs> it, would be, it would be very difficult to get around. Um, but yeah, your lungs can inflate quite a bit because they have just so much surface area to get all that oxygen in. I was just going to ask Harriet as well, when you, when you say our lungs inflate, is that something we can practice? That if we were to practice taking big deep breaths a lot, would we be able to increase our lung capacity? Like, do people like maybe swimmers or, or athletes have to work on their lung capacity to so they can take in more air? I mean, ab absolutely. You know, um, I actually used to play clarinet. <laughs> that takes oh, wow. quite a bit of lung capacity. And I would have to practice taking in a deep breath and holding and then breathing out in a really controlled way for as long as I could. So that were some of the um, activities that I did uh, to increase my lung capacity when I was just playing music um, for you know, athletes, Olympic swimmers, they definitely have to train in order to increase their lung capacity to allow them to do the best that they can and also be able to, you know, you have to take your breaths at a really timed way when you're swimming and you're going at full pelt. Um, you, you have to have a decent pair of lungs on you. Maybe that's something the school classes can practice after this. They can practice, you know, taking a big deep breath in. It might give the teachers uh, some peace and quiet as well. <laughs> Let's see if we can uh, get the next question up. Uh, this is from St. Paul's Primary 5. Hello, St. Paul's. Um, what happens to your lungs when you hiccup? Great question. Oh, that is a great question. <laughs> uh, so we have a very fancy word for hiccuping, um, and it's called dia... Oh, that's it. I've I can't believe I'm forgetting this line diaphragmatic on air. Diaphragmatic <laughs> irritation. I think that's, that's it. it. Something like so that. So essentially, it's not, um, you know, the air going in or anything like that. It's your diaphragm is, you know, it's working to the kind of schedule of the rest of your body. Um, but sometimes it can get irritated or it can kind of have a little bit of a muscular spasm. And that will cause you to take air in and push it out in a very... Um, you know, not unsteady way. Uh, and that's that's what hiccups are. It's just your your diaphragm uh, kind of having a muscular spasm. So hiccups aren't necessarily the lungs, but actually the diaphragm that sits just underneath. Is that right? Have I got that right? Yes, yes. Yeah, no, the diaphragm sits just underneath. You might even notice um, that one of our lungs, the right lung is a little bit shorter than our left lung. Um, just to make room for the diaphragm, which actually sits above the liver, you can actually see if we get to our other camera so we can see up close that we have a little bit of the liver still attached to our diaphragm. Amazing. Um, just a reminder to everybody watching, I think we've got a couple of minutes left. So if you do have any questions you want to ask, get them in as quick as you possibly can. But your questions so far have been absolutely brilliant. Uh, let's see if we can get the next one up. Ooh, so Harriet, you said that the organs smell. <laughs> what do they smell like? And I hope you can describe this as best as you possibly can. <laughs> you ever walked past a butcher's on a hot day? That's kind of what they smell like. Um, or if you have like defrosted meat um, for, for your dinner, and it's kind of when you open the packet and it's that kind of smell that comes out. I, I can't really describe it any other way, but when we were in the lab and we had a whole box full of lungs, it was quite overwhelming. <laughs> Can we have the next question up, please? Oh, great question as well. We've talked about this a little bit, but maybe we can talk about it uh, some more. Uh, how does exercise affect our lungs? So exercise uh, is really great for our lungs. It can help increase our lung capacity. Uh, it's basically, you know, your lungs and your diaphragm, it's, it's like a muscle, you know? You, you know, if you use it more, the stronger it becomes. Uh, so 
Obviously, we're taking a lot of oxygen into our body uh, when we exercise. Also, when we eat as well, you might notice that when you eat, you almost feel like you have to take in another quick breath because our bodies are processing all the stuff that's going into our bodies, all of the extra oxygen that we need. Um, so yeah, exercise can really help to increase your lung capacity, as we talked about with our Olympic swimmers. And I think we feel that sometimes in everyday life, like when you run up some stairs, or if you're late for class and you have to run to the classroom and you get there, you know, quite often we'll be going, <sighs> and you can actually feel your lungs going in and out. And that's because we've used so much air to get somewhere quicker. Uh, Harry, I was just, when I was watching your screen there, is that part of lungs still floating in the bowl? It is, yes, it is. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not going to sink anytime soon. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, I think we've got time for a, a couple more questions. This is from Lockfield again at primary five slash four. Great question again. How big are the lungs compared to your heart, Harriet? So the heart is actually, actually give me two seconds because I actually have a heart here. Oh, it's, it's exclusive. Good job you asked, Lockfield. Right, so da -da -da -da, here <laughs> is a heart. This is the heart that was actually attached to these lungs. Uh, if we look just at the back, you can see just above our diaphragm, we have another little membrane right here. And you can see we have these other cavities and holes. So this is the pericardium, and that's where the heart sits uh, just here. So you can see the heart is much, much smaller than the lungs. It fits in just behind. Uh, but yeah, there we go. It's, that's where your heart sits. And it's important, obviously, because we need to get all of that oxygen into our bloodstream. Uh, we need all the oxygenated blood to be going around our body. So the heart and lungs have to work together all of the time. I think, Harriet, if, if you have time, we could maybe do a very, very quick whistle stop tour of the heart while you've got that ready. Oh if my you'd goodness. Like. <laughs> I, I don't think that's a good idea. The last time I did the heart dissection, it went terribly. Um, you have to make sure that it's facing the right way and you have to feel for which wall is thicker because your heart sits in the middle of your chest. It's just larger on the left hand side. That's because the left hand side of the heart has to pump blood all the way around your body, whereas the right hand side is just pumping blood to your lungs. Uh, and I managed to cut into the heart backwards and I got completely lost in the <laughs> atriums and ventricles, the different chambers of the heart. Um, and it was it was an absolute disaster. <laughs> Well, fortunately, uh, today's dissection was, was far from a disaster and it was brilliant. So thank you so much, Harriet, for talk, taking us through that. Um, absolutely fascinating. Um, and unfortunately, yes, uh, that is the end of our lung dissection. We'd just like to say thank you so, so much to, to all the schools and, and for everyone at home for, for watching and, and sending in your, your questions. Um, the next live event we've got for the Curious About uh, Festival is our journey with germs at 2 p.m. So if you can come back and tune in at 2 p.m. for our journey with germs, that would be amazing. But uh, just one final thank you to Harriet uh, for your lung dissection and thank you so much to all you for for watching and we will see you soon